determinants of this peptide is, okay? Because you've just got the... Um, well, you've just got a leucine at the C-terminus, and you wouldn't see that peptide. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, or you wouldn't see that amino acid in the, in the mass spectrometry. Okay. So, there are other enzymes which are sometimes used for digestion. Okay, so one of those is lyse C, which cleaves C-terminal to lysine. And so, if you use lyse C on this protein lysozyme, I've highlighted the, the cleavage sites there. Um, and you can see you get, well, you get different, different peptides, okay? So these peptides are all fine. We know we've got a good sequence coverage from these. But you've also got this great long peptide, um, which is the C-terminal peptide. So from, from here, is it from here? Or is it? No, it's this, sorry, this central peptide here, which is, which is far too long for mass spectrometry. So actually, although we're getting the C-terminal peptide now, we, we would lose information from the, from the central region of that protein. Okay, so, um, so, so, so in this particular example, not so great. But in some cases, if trypsin isn't working, that's always the first pass, always the first sort of port of call is to try trypsin. And if you don't see the protein that you want to see or you, you, you're looking for, then think about using different enzymes. So lysine is one of those. Um, and glucine is another. Now, this cleaves a C-terminal of aspartic acid and glutamic acid. Okay. And so in this example, would give you these peptides. So one of the other benefits of trypsin, which I hadn't mentioned so far, is because it cleaves at lysine and arginine, pretty much all of the peptides that you generate, apart from the C-terminal peptide, are going to have lysine and arginine in them. Now, those are basic residues, and they're very important for ionization in mass spectrometry, so we, and we'll talk about that more later. But, so you need somewhere to put your proton so that you can um, ionize your peptide and detect it by mass spectrometry. Now, if you use um, GLU-C, then all of the peptides are either going to have aspartic acid or glutamic acid in them. Okay, So they're obviously acidic residues, so the peptide may not ionise as well in the mass spectrometry. Okay. So you have to bear that in mind. Now, you see most of these peptides do in fact have um, lysine and arginines in them, which is great, so probably they would ionise, but it's just a consideration that, that you, you know, you you might have to think about. Right, so, quiz. Why is it vital to wear gloves when you're preparing your trypsin digest for mass spectrometry? Yes? Your hands are mostly protein. They are, and you're, if you get keratin in your sample, you'll know about it, because... Mm -hmm. Keratin peptides ionise really well. So if you get, yeah, you, you, must, you can't, you can't ca contaminate your sample because all that will happen is that the trypsin will digest your proteins as well, your keratin, and then they'll show up in the, in, in the, in the analysis. So we, part of our lab runs a, a proteomic service, which you might use in your projects. Um, and it's very disheartening to be told that your sample contains keratin and not your protein of interest. So you always need to wear your, uh, your gloves when you're, when you're preparing the samples. Once the sample has been... Um, once the sample has been digested, then if keratin gets in, you're not going to see it. It's not going to turn up in the, uh, in the, in the mass spectrometry because it won't be digested. It will be too big. It will be, it will be too high a mass to be picked up in the mass spectrometry. So... So at least we know where the contamination occurs, because if you see keratin in the mass spectrometry analysis, it means it must have happened before the trypsin digestion or during the trypsin digestion. Okay, it can't have been afterwards. Right. So the other potential problem that you could face, as well as keratin, is the fact that you're adding trypsin to your sample, and trypsin will... Um, digest itself. Okay, so trypsin contains a number of 
lysine and arginine um, residues. And so when you add it in and you incubate it at 37 degrees, you produce all these peptides as well. Okay. And that's even more disheartening to be given your sample results back and told that they contain keratin and trypsin. So of course they do. So a way around that is to use um, something that's called trypsin gold. That's its commercial name. And this has had the uh, lysines capped. And they're, they're methylated. And what that means is that the trypsin can't digest itself at those sites. Okay, so it leaves only the arginine sites as um, possible cleavage sites within the trypsin. And so then you just get these two peptides shown in this square. Okay, so you will pick those up still in your analysis. Um, and the other peptides are far too big to be picked up. Okay, so that doesn't eliminate but reduces the problem of picking up trypsin in your, um, in your sample in your results. So that is preparing samples for mass spec. Everybody okay with it? All makes sense? Yes? yes? Okay. Right, in that case, we will move on to talk about mass spectrometry. And there's quite a lot to cover here, so it's good that we've, we've got onto it early. So for, for the first part, we're going to talk about sort of principles of mass spectrometry um, and, and these sort of underlying fundamentals and then talk about how we apply that in the proteomics workflow. Okay, so how we get the information that we need out about peptides and proteins. Okay. That figure again, right, we are now here. So we've got our complex mixture of triptych peptides and now we're going to look at mass spectrometry analysis. Okay, right, so there are a number of um, books that you can take a look at if you're interested in doing some further reading on mass spectrometry. There are, again, they're all available in the library so you can go and check those out. Okay, so let's start off with what is a mass spectrometer? Oops, too fast. Okay, so it is, I mean, the clue is in the name, all right? It's an instrument that measures the mass of individual molecules that have been converted to ions. So molecules have to be electrically charged. And the reason is because there are lots of different types of mass spectrometer, but they all use electric fields and or magnetic fields in order to separate the ions, okay? And so it, the, the molecules, your analytes of interest, they have to be charged. They have to be electrically charged or they're invisible to the mass spectrometer. Um, and using the mass spectrometer, you can calculate relative molecular masses. So I'm, I'm a bit biased, but I think mass spectrometry is the best um, analytical technique that's available because they measure this character, this fundamental property. So all molecules have a mass, okay? So it's not like... Um, they have to have an unpaired electron or they have to absorb light at a particular wavelength or they have to emit light at a particular wavelength, okay? All molecules have a mass and therefore if you can ionise them and make them electrically charged, in principle, you can look at them using mass spectrometry. Okay. So that's, that's why mass spec is the best. Right. All mass spectrometers comprise three parts. Note the red stars, okay? There's the ionisation source, which is where the ions are generated, okay? The mass analyzer, where the ions are separated according to their mass to charge, and the detector, where the ions are detected. And as I said already, there are lots of different types of mass spectrometer, and they use different ways. They use different electric fields or magnetic fields to separate the um, ions. There are lots of different ways to generate the ions um, and there are different ways to detect the ions, but they've all got those fundamental parts. They're all, they're all the, the, the same underneath in the, yeah, 
in that they have these three